So in this video, I'm going to go over one of the scariest times that I was catatonic, and if you don't know what catatonia is, that's okay, I'm going to explain it. Catatonia is a complex syndrome of motor abnormality, usually presenting itself in the form of immobility and mutism, though psychomotor agitation can also occur. It is believed to be a response to intense fear or anxiety, but not all who face catatonia experience this. It was first described by Carl Kahlbaum in the 1870s and persists to this day. Now, I have been catatonic many times over the years as part of my disorder, so many that I've lost count. And while I haven't had an episode in over a year, before I was properly medicated, I would have them fairly often both in and outside of episodes. And if you are new here, welcome. My name is Kit, and I have something called schizoaffective disorder, which is a condition where someone experiences symptoms of schizophrenia, such as delusions and hallucinations, but also symptoms of a mood disorder, either major depression or, in my case, bipolar. While you may have originally heard catatonia in terms of its relationship to schizophrenia, it's actually very common in affective disorders as well. Yes, schizoaffective disorder is included in this, but also bipolar disorder and depression. It can even happen in autism spectrum disorders. Now, while the story I'm about to tell you today isn't the first time I went catatonic, that type is up here, it was the second, and I was still trying to figure out what exactly being catatonic meant and how to deal with it at the time. But this is by far one of the more scary incidents that happened, and that's partially because of how inconvenient it was. But is there really a convenient time to be catatonic? Anyways, all the way back in 2017, I was in the midst of a manic episode, meaning I was feeling euphoric, I had a lot of energy, I was extremely creative, and I wasn't sleeping a lot. And I was all the way in Jamaica on a medical mission with a local Christian church. And I'm from the States, so going all the way to Jamaica and help people at the same time seemed like the perfect vacation for someone like me. However, to give some context, while I don't describe myself as religious, I'm more of a spiritual person, at the time of this trip, I was starting to have some religious delusions that were starting to make themselves known in my life. And, it, and it's important to note that with all of this, a lot of the things I was doing were motivated by a fear of this God that I was starting to believe in. And this was all happening in the very beginning of the episode that would eventually become my first major psychotic break. So I was still technically okay at this point, but more severe psychosis was starting to make itself known in my life. Anyways, the trip itself was great, everything was so beautiful, the food was amazing, and we helped a ton of people, so I got to see the medical field in action. But this story actually starts late one night when someone on the trip, we're gonna call him Reggie, asked to pray with me. Now I'm not bashing Christians in any way, shape, or form when I say what I'm about to say, but I've noticed that in Christian circles, praying with other people is extremely common, to the point where it happens all the time. And I was on a Christian medical mission, so it was bound to happen eventually. But it's not necessarily something that I enjoy. Now naturally, I wasn't exactly fond of a spontaneous prayer session in a foreign country, but I thought, eh, why not? How bad can it be? Spoiler alert, really effing bad. So we went out back, sat in some chairs on the porch, and he asked for my hands, and I, you know, gave them to him, and then he started praying. And it started off nice and calm, having gratitude for being on the trip and being able to help all the people, just being thankful for everything. Very chill stuff. And that was fine with me. But what I wasn't prepared for was when Reggie started shouting for God to show himself to us. To make his presence known in that moment, and this was a big problem for one primary reason. The god I was worshipping scared the crap out of me, so I assumed that Reggie was praying to the exact same god. And if the god that I was worshipping showed himself to me in a very visceral way, well, I couldn't exactly handle that thought. So I started freaking out on the inside, and it didn't help that the wind was really starting to pick up, because while we were in Jamaica there was a tropical depression, so lots of wind whipping trees back and forth. It was very loud, it was very noisy, and with Reggie screaming and yelling and all of this other stuff, it was just really overwhelming for me. And so I started having what I believe to be either a very intense anxiety attack or a full-on panic attack. And so my heart rate was skyrocketing, I was breathing too fast, I suddenly everything was going too fast all at once, and with Reggie yelling and yelling and yelling, and then my delusions really starting to, you know, make themselves known in my brain, and the fear and the anxiety, and it just all got to be too much. And so right smack dab in the middle of that prayer, I froze. Like, completely froze, solid, statue, couldn't speak, couldn't communicate, couldn't move. And my first thought was, oh crap, it's happening again. And so just like the first time this happened, I could still blink and I could still breathe, but neither was under my voluntary control. 
Blinking and breathing were basically on autopilot or something, but the most important thing here is that all voluntary motion had stopped. And so I'm frozen there, and Reggie is still very quite into his prayer, and I realize with a dawning horror that he's not gonna know what happened to me. Seeing someone going from being lively and bubbly to being an unresponsive potato can be very jarring. And so to avoid that jarring feeling, I started trying to wiggle my big toe, trying to wiggle my fingers, try to move anything, just to kind of try to maybe get out of it before he realizes that something's wrong. Because I knew eventually he had to stop praying, right? And nothing worked because of course it didn't. No wiggling my big toe, no shaking my head, no twitching my fingers, none of it worked. I was still, still. And of course, in the midst of all of this panic and anxiety I was feeling from Reggie doing his prayer, I was also having internal panic because, oh my God, it was happening again. And the last time this happened, I was in the ER. I was surrounded by doctors. Even if they didn't immediately pay attention to me, I was still in a hospital. And here I was in Jamaica, so far away from home, so far away from the nearest hospital. I was very far away from my health insurance on top of that. And I just didn't know what to do. Of course, I couldn't do anything, but I could think. I can always think when I'm catatonic. And I was really worried that, what if I didn't snap out of it this time? What if I was actually stuck like this for a while? What if I needed medical attention? And so I'm having all of these horrible, scary, spiraling thoughts. And at the same time, I'm trying to like force myself to snap out of it before Reggie finishes praying. Well, time passed, the prayer ended, and I didn't snap out of it. I didn't at all. And so I saw Reggie sit up, he let go of my hands, and he looked at me and I couldn't exactly look at him because I couldn't move, but he didn't really, he just kind of stared for a moment. And then he started saying, Kit, Kit, hello. And I couldn't say anything. So I just continued to stare into space, total unresponsiveness. And so he made the decision then to pull me into a hug, which would have probably been pretty nice if he hadn't blocked part of my nose in the process. And so then I was stuck in a position where not only could I not move, but I could also not breathe fully. And this is the moment where I realized I definitely wasn't faking it this whole time because I definitely have imposter syndrome when it comes to being catatonic because it's one of those things that when you're experiencing it and you can't move and you can't speak, you can't communicate. Well, your brain goes, oh, what if you're making all of this up? What if it's literally just you faking it the entire time? And this situation where my nose was squished against someone's shoulder and I didn't have full range of air, well, if I was faking it, I would have been able to move because that's almost a life threat in a way. And given I couldn't move and I was still stuck not being able to breathe fully, yeah, I definitely, um, that's the debunk for the imposter syndrome right there. And so I start freaking out even more because now I think I'm gonna pass out and die because I can't move to clear my airway. Dramatic, I know, but catatonia can be very dramatic, especially to the person experiencing it. Because as you can tell by this story, there's a lot of fear, anxiety, and nervousness when it comes to this entire syndrome. And so I do what I do best when I'm catatonic. I think myself to death. Because that's really all I can do, think. So now I was having issues breathing, I was still frozen, and again, no one knew that this was a thing that could happen to me, because to me, it only happened once. I didn't think it was gonna happen again, especially so soon. And at this point in my experience with schizoaffective disorder, I didn't know what preceded my catatonic episodes. I had no way to predict when they could happen. Now I have a pretty good idea of the situations where it might arise, but I still can't predict when it will happen. But at this point, nobody, Nobody on the trip knew that it was a possibility because I still thought it might've been a one-time thing. But anyway, back to the story. I'm frozen, I can barely breathe, and I'm really worried that someone's gonna get called and yeah, everyone's gonna know. And so Reggie actually let me go of the hug. Ooh, I can breathe again. And he just kind of stared at me for a while. But to my surprise, while Reggie was still sitting there staring at me, as quickly as I had frozen, I thought, and I was able to move again. I could look around. I could like control my breathing, control my blinking. I could do all of that. And I didn't have to go to the hospital. And Reggie, well, I explained to him what happened in layman's terms. And to my relief, he literally shoved it under the rug, didn't mention it to anyone. And there was no mention of it for the rest of the trip. But yeah, in this case, the catatonia was just a result of a very intense anxiety attack or a panic attack. And I don't let anyone pray with me with that kind of fervor anymore for obvious reasons. And so I survived my second catatonic episode in a foreign country at that with no ECT, no lorazepam, and no ER visits at all. And the difference between this one and the first episode was the first episode 
when I thawed, I basically was like, oh, okay, I'm not paralyzed. Okay, I didn't have a stroke. Okay, I'm not dying. I'm not dead. I'm not about to die. All of that stuff was first episode. Second episode was, okay, I know this isn't gonna kill me, but it's still really scary and I feel very helpless. And so this time around when I thawed, it was more of a like, Whew, okay, I don't have to get involved with the Jamaican medical system. Okay, I don't have to be stuck like this. Okay, I don't have to be helpless anymore. I'm not helpless anymore. And so that happened all the way back in 2017. It's 2023 as I'm making this video. So in the last six years, I have learned that when I have intense fear, intense anxiety, when I have really bad panic attacks, really bad anxiety attacks, they will end in at least me being catatonic for 10 or 15 minutes. But anyway, that's enough about catatonia for today. I'll probably talk about it more in future videos, of course, but what if you, <laughs> oh my gosh, it's been a day, guys, it's been a day. But do you have any catatonia stories? Do you also go catatonic? What is it like for you? Do tell me in the comment section down below. If you don't want to talk there, if it's a little bit too public, you can also talk to me on Twitter and Instagram, at SchizoKidzo, and I love talking to you guys about mental health. But anyways, that's all for today's video. Thank you guys so much for watching and joining me in making the uncomfortable comfortable. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.